At first glance, it's the most beautiful city in the world. A perfect encounter between the hand of man and the work of nature. The power of the elements, the vitality of the people, the tropical exuberance, this is a very special place, a paradise. This is a tropical country, and nature here is an essential part of our lives. But behind the postcard views, the picture's not so glossy. Nature is suffering here. In fact, it's no paradise at all. This city, which from one Earth summit to another has continued to launch new concepts of sustainable development and biodiversity, is in the grip of an ecological crisis. The battle is on. We're running out of time. But what will actually transform Rio? The politicians? The miracle of the Olympics that's supposed to save the city? Or the people themselves? Rio de Janeiro is waking up. A whole new city is underway with all the energy, the dreams, and the social awareness of a brand new country. They say that the folks from the favelas can always find a solution. And that's what we're seeing. That's what you feel if you live or you've grown up in those communities. Can Rio get back to nature? There's no time to wait. No, this isn't the Space Shuttle Mission Control. It's the Rio de Janeiro Operations Center, where 400 people take the pulse of the city 24-7. With 12 million inhabitants from downtown to the suburbs, Rio is reaching saturation point. The risk of total collapse is so present that day and night there are teams of climatologists, geologists, town planners, and crisis management experts keeping a close eye on the city and all its tensions. It's 4.30 on a Wednesday afternoon, and a car is floating down a main avenue on the south side of town. The rainy season is a high-risk period for Rio. For the last five years, it's been getting worse. In 2010, whole areas of the city were wiped out by landslides, with more than 500 people dead or missing. In 2011, it was the same thing, and the biggest ever natural catastrophe in the state of Rio, with over 800 victims, almost all residents of the poor districts up on the mountain slopes where they had to cut down forests to build. There's nothing to hold the soil in place, and with every storm, it all collapses. A few minutes before the landslide, the family all managed to get away. How can a city built by the sea and surrounded by virgin forest have so lost touch with nature that it has become a danger to its own inhabitants? We will have more flaws and more strongly flaws, and we know that. And the people in position of more vulnerability are exactly the poor people. They are near the rivers, they are in places in the mountain. And then we need to prepare now, looking for 10, 20 years ago, to prepare the city for a lot of things, especially the elevation of sea level. Rio de Janeiro is not the only major city on the Brazilian coast. 84% of the country's 200 million inhabitants are concentrated in Rio, San Paulo, Salvador de Bahia, and Recife. They have transformed the whole coast and destroyed 97% of the Atlantic forest, once more rich in biodiversity than Amazonia. This galloping urbanization siphons all the resources from the interior of the country. Without the coast's green mantle, its climate has been disrupted. But aside from its climatic problems, Rio is undergoing a general disruption of the environment. The poorest districts are at the heart of this ecological crisis. People here build their houses on top of each other with no help or urban planning, and are thus exposed to serious urban pollution. There are no sewers. The former streams and riverbeds are all cemented over and that's where the wastes of 800,000 families all crowded together end up. 
the inhabitants have lost all contact with nature. There are a lot of territory of the city where live more than two million people and special poor people of the city. They don't have this grim. They don't have this nature. They don't have until now uh, all the public service about waste and, and sanity everybody deserves to have. And then this is also a social question. Rio can no longer hold back what is now an inexorable process. The city may be just months away from hosting the World Cup, but its famous beaches are fast succumbing to pollution. And nobody seems to care. It's as if the sad truth were hidden by all the beauty. How could this beautiful city, the envy of the world, have gotten to this point? Rio has turned its back on nature. Yet, it is the fruit of its environment, shaped and conditioned by geography like no other huge city on the planet. To understand its history, you have to grasp this powerful, wild, and monumental geography. What is Rio's true nature? First of all, there's Rio's Bay, Guanabara Bay. It's gigantic, over 800 square kilometers, and was once the most beautiful bay in the world, home to mangroves and whales right up until the 1950s. It was also the home to the very first settlers who were fascinated by its unique geography. It was from the bay that the city expanded, threading its way through the natural obstacles. South of the bay, Rio curves around the majestic Mount Tijuca and its forest to reach the Atlantic, then spreads further, contained only by the famous Morros, those gigantic needles of granite that give the city its striking appearance. For centuries, Rio continued to hug the coast. But in the 20th century, the city broke loose. For the first time, it outgrew its geography, straddling mountains and forests to gain new territory. On their way, the new districts devastated lagoons, marshes, estuaries, a whole mosaic of ecosystems. Only three big forests still stand, protected by their steep hills. Rio is a very singular city in the world because uh, we have a, an incredible quantity and quality of natural assets, three rainforests, two bays, lagoons, and spectacular oceanic littoral. And uh, it's in the middle of two, 12 million and a half people. And we are together, rich and poor people. We don't have a center. And then outside, we are, everybody mix and mix with this nature. Rio is held back by the ocean to the south. But another sea borders it to the north, a human sea, whose waves keep breaking day after day against the city's high ground for as far as you can build. And up there, where the city reaches its limits, the forest takes over. This forest and the water it produces are Rio's greatest reservoirs of life, three massive wooded areas that together make up the world's biggest urban forest. The last relics of the extraordinary natural world that for century was Rio, they bear witness to the powerful ecology that reigned here before the Portuguese colonists arrived. They were the first to declare war on nature. José Padua is an environmental historian. He has written several studies of the evolution of Brazilian society, and Rio holds no more secrets for him. When the Europeans arrived here at the beginning of the 16th century, 
they saw a landscape that was very different from the European one. We had a continuous rainforest from northeast to south Brazil. At that time, had more than one million square kilometers. But they, they were, were not able to perceive that uh, the most precious thing, uh, the most precious knowledge the people here had was the knowledge about what they call now uh, biodiversity. Amerindians living in small villages of five, 500, 600 people, living a, what, they, what they saw as a simple life. Uh, they were a little bit disappointed because they did not see here in Brazil what uh, cities or mines, how, how like the Spanish uh, saw in Mexico and Peru. No legendary cities, no gold, no matter. The Portuguese were skilled merchants and they decided to settle. Europe was in great need of wood, and the tree they called Pau Brasil was so abundant here, they named the country after it. When the trees which they used to make dye were all used up, they turned to coffee, easy to grow on deforested soil. Wealthy, ever more opulent, the colony soon had seven million inhabitants, all busily cutting down the forest and growing first coffee and then later sugarcane what I call the myth of endless nature, this view that you can use, that you can burn forests here because uh, far away you'll find more forests and more forests. And this was not good for the establishment of sustainable ways of life because it gives this impression that you, don't, you do not need to conserve, you do not need to care for the natural resources because they are so, so inexhaustible that you, you can use them uh, careless. In the 19th century, it wasn't just the forest that seemed inexhaustible. Of Brazil's seven million inhabitants, the huge majority, five million of them, were slaves. After abolition, a huge population was left looking for housing, for work, and for an identity. To this population of slaves were added in the 19th century fresh migrants drawn from around the world by Rio's promise. The ebullience of the 20th century, especially in the 70s, radically transformed the city. The wealthy built the city of skyscrapers against the backdrop of virgin forest and with views of the sea. The poor just lived wherever they could. With the mechanization of agriculture in, in Brazilian countryside in the 1960s and 70s, Thousands of people had to leave the country and, and came to the cities. So they went to the hills, they went to the mangroves, and created what we call the, the favelas. Who has not heard of the favelas? The dictionary translation is slums or sometimes shanty towns. In reality, the first time the term was used was in a district called Canudos. There was a little square there with a tree called a favela. A community grew up around the tree and took its name from it. Ever since, whenever a group of families finds an uninhabited spot and builds houses there, they call it a favela. True story or not, the fact is, there are today two million inhabitants of a thousand favelas spread out across the city with no urban planning or politics. Originally, the favelas nobly gave shelter to the poor, and the water that ran down from the mountains was pure. Today, those forest streams run through kilometers of favelas with no purification plants or sanitation. The water that flows into the Bay of Rio is polluted, toxic even. Biologist Mario Moscatelli is a key figure in nature conservation in Rio. Above all, though, he's a fighter. He's the spokesman for all those who, like him, are tired of the city's apathy and the powerlessness of the state. He's funded by residence associations and real estate companies. And once a week, he flies over the bay and the lagoons of Rio to monitor the pollution and denounce the polluters. In the 80s, you could still find 40 different species of fish in this lagoon. But there's just one invasive species left, the tilapia. There used to be hundreds of species of birds, reptiles, mammals. 
Today, there's hardly five or ten species left. But you do find sofas, TVs, chairs, bodies, anything. It's a real sewer, and there's no more water. It's completely contaminated, not a drop of oxygen. And with all the gases it gives off, the sulfur and the methane, it makes your eyes sting. The smell's unbearable. It stinks. In this 130-hectare area, we've had to install about two kilometers of fencing. I think I must be one of the world's most qualified garbage men. I spend 95% of my time, me, a biologist, stopping rubbish getting into regeneration zones and clearing rubbish out of them. It's my worst enemy right now, the garbage, and the civilization that's producing it all and chucking it into streams and rivers. Observing Rio's ecology since 1997, Mario Moscatelli has seen urban and industrial pollution poisoning ecosystems in the bay, from the lagoons, the marshes, and even the lakes throughout the whole of Rio and its suburbs. Is it irreversible? No, there's hope. In these magnificent virgin forests at the heart of the city, there are still true ecological treasures. It is thanks to these forests that Rio could one day get back to nature. Up there, the forest is nature's barometer. There are species of animals that have been there for more than 25,000 years. The force of nature is still strong. Three point six centimeters. Vinicius is one of the rare urban biologists to take an interest in Rio's surviving animals, like this frog that's only found here on a hundred meter stretch of river deep in the forest. Folklore says that these are magical creatures, but this one looks so small and fragile. Ilosia nasus is endemic to this region. Amphibians are the sentinels of the environment. The presence here of this individual indicates that this park has an excellent level of environmental quality, even of the water in the park. In well-preserved areas covered with forest and little streams, the quality of the environment attains a level that favors the presence of these animals. The further down you go in the forest, the more wastewater you find emptying into the rivers. So when you get near the houses, these amphibians tend to disappear. No princess has ever kissed it, but all the same, this little frog, proper name Elosionassus, is still proof of a miracle. There are still many preserved areas from which Rio could regenerate itself. The battle is not lost. The water from the forests arrives in the lagoon polluted, so Mario Moscatelli wants to purify it. But how? By replanting along the shore the mangroves, those forests on stilts that live to the rhythm of the tides. They are a veritable biomechanical machine for depolluting the water, a natural way of putting air back into the water. It's important to plant mangroves. Because they're like maternity wards and supermarkets. They're filters. 
They maintain the diversity of the whole intertropical coastal zone. There are many other ecosystems, such as the coral reefs, but especially on the Brazilian coast, both small and commercial fishermen, as well as ecotourism, all depend on the mangroves. Without them, there'd be no fish, no crabs, practically no biodiversity. In 13 years, with the help of the municipality, Mario's team has rebuilt, plant by plant, 30 hectares of mangrove. Through urbanization, the airport, the embankments, and industrialization, the bay has lost 60% of its surface and is getting dangerously dry. The greatest loss, 35 years ago, was the 130 hectares of mangrove buried beneath the city's Gramacho refuse dump, a landfill the size of a 130 football stadiums, right next to the city and right on the bay at water level. In 2012, aware of the ecological emergency, the municipality decided to close the dump. But for 35 years, Gramacho, covered these days by a thick coat of soil, accumulated 9,000 tons of waste per day. The closure of the landfill was both a difficult decision and a difficult task. There were 20,000 recyclers, the catadores, working there in nightmarish condition, risking their lives every day amongst the constant trucks and the whims of the bulldozers and rendering the site inaccessible. But after years of false promises, the city of Rio has at last closed Gramacho. It's the first tangible sign of the city's transformation, the beginnings of a political will that took shape only a month before the Earth Summit. Since the closure, most of the recyclers have been encouraged to leave and paid off. Rose, who made her living from the dump, did not want to leave. Along with her husband, she opened a little recycling business. Every day, she stocks up from cast-offs at the shopping centers and here and there in the city, sorting and resorting the waste to sell it on to wholesalers. In two years, she has gone from a horse to a little van, and now a truck. These days, she can load a ton of waste every trip and usually recycles 800 kilos of it. Before I worked at the landfill, I didn't know what was polluting and what wasn't, what you could or couldn't recycle. We threw stuff around and wasted a lot of it. So I learned to recycle and to think of the environment and nature. I came to understand a lot about nature, and I'm still learning. We got where we are today thanks to the landfill. Plastic, scrap iron, aluminum, paper, cardboard, glass. Rose and Marco Aurelio sort 20 sacks a day. The plastic sells at 45 euro cents the kilo. Cardboard and paper fetch 25 cents. Their hard work means their children now go to school. To get rid of its 9,000 tons a day of waste, Rio has opened an ultra-modern landfill, this time far from the sea, where the waste is treated in a controlled environment. Two years after the closure, Guanabara Bay is starting to look healthier. People are making a bit of money. They're fishing again, selling fish. That's the power of nature for you. I reckon it's God's helping hand. The closing down of Gramacho has been hailed as the end of a crime against nature. And day by day, nature is reasserting herself, leaving behind the days when she was run out of town. Until the 1970s, uh, Brazilian government was asking companies uh, that produced a lot of pollution in, the, in Europe and in the United States to come to Brazil because they published an uh, advertisement saying, welcome pollution, we are open for pollution. The policy of excessive development belongs to 20th century history. Today, Rio wants to move into a new era with a new face, a greener soul, and action symbolic of its respect for life. 
Three years ago, the Minister of the Environment set up a research group. Both biologists and urban planners testified that the city's ecological and climatic stability depended principally on its three forests, the sole refuge of surviving greenery from the primary forest, and today isolated from each other and thus unable to regenerate. So the work group founded a pilot project to open up the three upland areas, linking them by way of all the pockets of greenery that still exist here and there in Rio, and thus allowing life to circulate once more through the corridors created. The project is codenamed Green Corridors. The points on this map all show the priority zones to be linked. The aim is to mend the ecosystem of Rio with lifelines that knit together the forests and parks with the urban zones. What's happening is that those hills there, the extremities of the two massifs, have become densely built up. This basin here is known as the Jacare Pagua district. It's one of our biggest challenges to recuperate these zones, where we've already done a certain amount of replanting. It'll allow the wildlife to circulate between the two massifs along our big green corridor. The idea of the eco-corridors is to restore the exchange between biotopes. At one time, the plain, the marshes, the lake, and the ocean all communicated, and their ecosystems were interdependent. The corridors open up the canals again, freeing the waters to mingle and regenerate, revitalizing both flora and fauna in a mutual exchange. This section of Green Corridor is actually part of the system of lagoons. If you picture the coastline of Barra da Tijuca, there's the rocky spur of Pedro de Gavia down there, and lagoons all along the seafront. The Green Corridor here is made up of canals that are passages between the conservation units. Down there, there's a Tijuca Massif on one side, and on the other, the Pedra Branca. And here's the connection. It's made up of marshes that are part of the lagoon system, so there are always canals where you find animals that need water and vegetation. The Capybara the largest rodent in the world has been the first to benefit from the prototype corridors. It is adept at moving into new territory and as a species is now able to revitalize its genetic stock. And on the way, like all animals, it's carrying with it seeds and pollens to regenerate the vegetation. The other animals are following the capybara's lead, rushing into these corridors and enriching city life. The urban forests are the biological reservoirs from which wildlife is starting to take back the city of Rio. The monkeys, true opportunists, are already surging into the city. Ever cheekier bands of coatis are launching raids on the city as it renews its link with nature. Capybaras have made themselves at home by the lagoons. They're tolerated and protected. It's not easy for man and beast to coexist in the city, though, and the local alligator is in danger of paying the price. Ricardo Malaguti, a young biologist, works with the caimans. These antediluvian animals, called jacarés by the Indians, who live in the shallows of a lake now encircled by the city, have lent their name to the district built on their territory, Jacaré Pagua. There are about three to 4,000 of them in Rio. 
Here in the city of Rio de Janeiro, it's rumored that the Caymans present a risk for inhabitants. Stories go around about pet dogs being eaten while out for their walk. In reality, the Caymans are fascinating. Ultimately, it's the people of Rio who are a danger to the Jacarés. Our studies in Rio show that Cayman numbers are very high for the region. We've already captured and marked just over 400 of them so far. So, do the Caymans have Chihuahua or Toy Poodle remains in their tummies? In fact, all the biologists find is chickens. All we found in the stomach of this animal is food it has been given. These animals have stopped hunting for their own food. They just sit here and wait to be fed. I always walk by here. I come and visit them every day. I love seeing them. If you throw them food, you'll be helping to destroy their social behavior. If they don't go searching for food, they end up conditioned and dependent. You must have noticed the number of caimans is growing around here. Rio's jacarés, tempted by a free lunch, are leaving their nesting areas and losing their predatory instincts. Ricardo Malaguti is worried for the species' future. Rio will just have to learn to live with the beast. The green corridors are the result of a policy of reforestation inaugurated 25 years ago. Six million trees have been replanted in areas where they had disappeared. Ecological issues seem to be getting through to the politicians. For a long time, there's been a general attitude to development that doesn't see nature as an economical asset. This is a tropical country, and nature here is an essential feature of our lives. We have a lot of plans in the city. In three years, no part of Rio de Janeiro will be far from 10 minutes, 15 minutes walking a green Park. We will plant 24 million trees and we will try to distribute these green areas around the city and other places where, uh, where they don't have uh, really the same nature we have here. If the authorities are to apply these policies of reforestation and green networks, they're going to have to reconquer some hitherto inaccessible urban areas, the favelas. Rio's favelas have long been in the hands of the drug traffickers, who make use of the miles and miles of labyrinthine little alleyways. The Brazilian police are starting to take back the city. Over the last 10 years, they've cleaned up half of the 1,000 favelas. At last, the favelas are opening up to urban renewal. And in the meantime, the cleanup has had a surprising consequence. It has put Rio's municipality back in touch with an unjustly overlooked sector of its population. The cleanup was a good thing because there's less violence. People have more contact. They can learn, like here now. You can be here now. It wouldn't have been possible before. Well, it would, but it would have been a whole big number. 
But more surprising still is that they didn't wait for the cleanup or for help from the authorities to start getting back to nature. Many people and associations were already working to achieve harmony with nature. Their quiet approach to ecology is as ingenious as it is exemplary. In the Alimao favela, Edson Gomez has initiated an eco-project worthy of being taken up by all Rio's disadvantaged communities, the Sustainable Favela. His association is called Verdejar, or Regreen. Its aim is to improve people's quality of life, but above all, to give children in the favelas a better future. As far as we know, we're pioneers. We're the first to suggest environmental work in the favela. And we're no beginners. We've been working on this for 15 years. A work group on the vegetable garden, which you've already seen. Then we'll have an agroforestry group down there. This is a project to create sustainable housing in the favelas with garbage collection, wastewater treatment, solar-powered hot water, energy production, and stormwater treatment. We're also implementing selective waste sorting. We want to recuperate organic waste for compost and to plant trees, grow vegetable gardens, produce food, reforest and capture carbon. The association's workshops keep the children occupied when they're not at school. They're no longer begging like they used to. Verdejar may be financially poor, but it is certainly rich in the contact it can give children with nature. One day, people say, the favela will come down the mountain and conquer the city. But we say it's already come down. It's already conquered the whole of Brazil, with joy, with sport, with love, and music, and painting. Opposite Verdejar, another community has also taken its destiny into its own hands. In the Vigidal favela, Manuel, who used to quarry and carve marble, has been creating gardens. To his neighbors, he's a hero. Since 1996, he's shifted eight tons of mosquito and disease-infested filth. They sleep better now, thanks to him, and they have the gardens to breathe in and get some rest. We're in Sitier, in the Vidigal community. In 1996, we got together and decided to do something for the environment. There was a huge tip with old tires and plastic bottles. And we cleaned it all up. City Hall, the Rio State government, none of them had done anything for the environment. So we got together and transformed this huge pile of trash into an oasis of green for all the generations to come. It's really worthwhile doing something for the environment. From their favelas or wherever they are in the vastness of Rio, Graça, Edson Gomez, Manuel and their friends are doing all they can to help Rio once again open its windows to the world that surrounds it a natural world of tropical beauty too long neglected. Us true cariocas from the Rio community, when we look at our rich cousins, Ipanema, 
Leblon, Copacabana. We're in heaven. If God ever made anything as beautiful as this view, well, I never saw it. Just look. Taken as a whole, all these spontaneous initiatives contribute in their way to the Green Corridors policy. The idea of the Green Corridors is to link together the big centers, but also the small and medium-sized ones, right down to individual houses. It's all been worked out. We've accounted for all the birds and all the wildlife. We've even noticed the same birds turning up in different parks along the Green Corridor. The people of Rio's hope of getting back to the nature they once had relies on the small initiatives as much as on the big ones. They're already multiplying and things are speeding up. But if it's really going to get back to being a city of nature, Rio also needs its visionaries. There's one man in Rio who has the political will and who also has the trust of all the people. His name is Jao Regui. He's an architect, and it was his dream for Rio to become the green capital of the planet in 2020. All of Rio is looking to his charisma and his humanist vision to make the renovation of the favelas really happen. This tireless town planner has been working for 15 years to reunify the city, a city divided both geographically and socially. first project set out his aims, a cable car that soars above the favelas that he wants to open up and turn green. There's no doubt that ecology is a big issue in Rio, as is the sheer impact of the landscape itself. The cable car system is one way to restructure things between those areas that are excluded and included, which will both benefit from this new urban vision. The cable car obviously encourages social mobility, what we call debunkerizing. I think today we can fulfill Le Corbusier's dream with aerial connections, lighting, cable cars, and other things that don't harm the Earth. I see the introduction of vegetation as a fundamental need that has to go hand in hand with urbanization, and that remains to be done. There's still a lot of work to do here. In Jao Regui's view, if Rio wants to become a green, sustainable city, it first has to have social justice and eradicate the inequalities between the rich and the poor areas. Rio of the future is one city, not two. In his city laboratory, Jao Regui is working to link the outsider communities to Rio's main ecosystem. His efforts have even included lifting up trains. This is Monguinos, one of the most complex favelas in Rio. They call it the Gaza Strip. You just couldn't go out here day or night. It was completely overrun by drug dealers. And now it's being cleaned up. The main thing was to create a public space that would connect the two separate ends of the favela by raising the railway line. It still needs all the greenery. The plan is to hang plants under each arch and plant trees along either side. Jao Regui has already renovated thousands of dwellings in more than 20 favelas. 
He's working as part of the Favela Bairro program. The favelas, the city of Rio, the federal state, and the banks have all invested more than $600 million to little by little transform the favelas into real neighborhoods. With the success of the early schemes, the municipality has green-lighted work on 100 more favelas. They'll soon have access to drinking water, energy, street lighting, and sanitation, without which pollution is a major problem. Rio has been choking on its own waste, but Jao Regui's transformations are gradually making the dream possible, to become the world symbol of the sustainable city, humane, functional, and respectful of the environment. Rio is hoisting the green flag, intent on setting the example. For the World Cup, the famous Maracana Stadium is going ecological, producing some of its own energy and recycling its rainwater. But after the World Cup will come another planetary-scale event that could act as a catalyst for Rio. On the 2nd October 2009, the 2016 Olympic Games were awarded to Rio de Janeiro. Will the Olympic Games give Rio the extra momentum it's been lacking? At any rate, the city is clearly pulling out all the stops on the greenness and sustainability of its plans. It has promised the world a clean city for the Olympics. Being chosen for the Olympics is a great victory for Rio on the international stage. It's also a recognition of the extent to which Brazil has changed over the last decade. These are all factors that mean we can now take the necessary measures to resolve our environmental problems. The city of Rio has promised that the 10 billion euros for the games will also be used to sanitize the favelas, create public transport, clean up the bay, and make up for lost time in making Rio a sustainable city. Now this financial manna just has to be used well. For Moscatelli, it all depends on the attitude of the politicians. We're spending a billion reals on rebuilding the Maracana. We need 550 million just to dredge this area. It's a question of priorities. Operationally, technically, I'm sure we can still reverse the process. We have to start by immediately dredging the bay. We have to take out five or six million cubic meters of mud and waste. Then, we have to recuperate the banks by replanting mangroves and marshlands and set up treatment plants on the rivers to stop waste and sewage getting into the lagoon system. If we can't put a stop to the chaos on both local and regional levels, in three years, it'll be too late. All the money will be gone, and the political will will evaporate once the spotlight's off of us. Will Rio at last seize the chances being offered by its moment of fame? We're rebuilding our relationship with nature now and making it a cultural asset. People are increasingly understanding that we have to put nature first. We have to use it to improve our conditions, our whole way of life. People live in cities, feel cities, feel the transformations in the climate, and uh, put pressure in their leaders, in their mayors. That's the reason cities around the world go fastly than nations in this, which is the more important questions of the new years and decades. In the Rio landscape, there are some conspicuous signs of transformation. In 1992, at the first Earth Summit, Rio started the whole planet questioning itself. Today, Rio strikes again by building the most forward-looking museum in the world, the Museum of Tomorrow. It's an immense modern and visionary nautilus, a museum in reverse. Instead of exhibiting the past, it shows us the future, a long-dreamed-of era 
where between man and his environment, it's not about conflict or profit. It's all about respect and balance in sustainable cities built on nature and with nature. And the postcard that is Rio will be a much brighter picture with green forests, with blue bays, and with equality for its people.